Welcome to the Quick Pro Camera Guide for the Nikon D3100. This is a great camera that will capture amazing images as well as HD video. We hope you'll enjoy learning more about it with this DVD. This guide is meant to be a study tool to be used in connection with, and not a replacement of, your camera's owner's manual. You can watch it entirely in one sitting or by chapter. Press the menu button at any time to return to the main menu, and feel free to use the forward or back buttons on your DVD remote to find a particular chapter. The functions and features of the D3100 that we cover are designed to give you a solid working knowledge of your camera. Our goal is to not only explain how to adjust the settings on your camera, but also help you understand when and why you would be motivated to take creative control of your camera. It's really not possible to cover every possible configuration on your camera, but we will provide you with a very solid foundation to build your digital photography skills on. With this new information, you'll be able to improve your ability to capture great pictures in a variety of shooting settings. Let's begin with a quick overview of the major parts of a digital SLR camera. The first item is the lens. The lens magnifies and focuses an image. It also controls how much or how little light will enter the camera. The second element is the shutter. The shutter assembly reflects the image onto the viewfinder. When you press the shutter button, the shutter opens for a very precise period of time to expose the image sensor to the focused image. The third component is the image sensor. The image sensor is a silicon chip that is exposed to the image, much like film in older cameras. It records the image precisely so it can be converted to a digital file for storage on a memory card. The memory card is used to store your images until they're archived onto a computer hard drive or burned to a CD or DVD. Remember, it might be convenient to use multiple memory cards. When one card is full, you can simply insert a new card and continue shooting pictures. You can use memory cards to store images either permanently or temporarily, but the least expensive way to archive your images is to save them onto a CD or a hard drive on your computer. The D3100 employs the 14.2 megapixel CMOS image sensor. The number of megapixels determines the size and quality of prints you can make. With an image sensor this large, you'll be able to make high quality prints of at least 12 by 18 when shooting with the camera's highest resolution. Whether you print your pictures or view them digitally, with some patience and practice in applying the concepts in this tutorial, you'll be able to create and capture the best pictures possible. Before you start taking pictures, you'll need to follow a few simple steps to get your camera ready. You'll need to put the battery in, attach a lens, insert an SD memory card, and adjust the diopter. If you're already familiar with these steps, use your remote to skip this chapter. First, let's insert the battery into the camera. Make sure the battery is fully charged before moving forward. It usually takes about one and a half hours to charge a fully depleted battery. It's extremely important that you always turn your camera off before replacing the battery or inserting the memory card. To insert your battery, slide the lever to open the battery compartment door and insert the battery with the contact points in first. The number of pictures you can take with a fully charged battery varies according to use. In normal conditions, you can get about 500 pictures from a full battery charge. Keep in mind that using the flash affects how much power the camera uses. If you're doing a lot of flash photography, keep an eye on the battery level. To mount or install a lens, make sure the camera is switched to off. Hold the camera with one hand and the lens with the other like this. Align the lens's index with the camera's index, then gently rotate the lens counterclockwise until it clicks into place. Take great care not to scratch the lens by allowing it to make contact with anything. When you need to clean the lens, it's a good idea to use a lens cloth. Other fabrics can dull or scratch your lens. When you want to dismount the lens, press the lens release button while holding the camera with the same hand. Then with the other hand, rotate the lens until it uncouples. Try not to change lenses in windy or dusty conditions. This will help the image sensor stay clean and free of dust. To insert a memory card, slide open the memory card slot and insert the card with the manufacturer's logo facing towards the back of the camera. Do not force the card. If it's not positioned correctly, 
Forcing the card can cause damage to the camera and the card. Let's take a look at the high resolution LCD monitor on the back of the camera. This screen is where you can monitor your pictures and one of the areas where you can access camera settings. To display the menu, press the menu button. Use the command dial or multi-selector to choose a menu and press the right arrow on the multi-selector or the OK button to confirm your selection. To instantly see shooting settings, press the information edit button. To make changes on the information display, press the information edit button again and use the multi-selector and command dial to adjust camera settings. Take some time to get a feel for how the command dial and the multi-selector work together to give you navigation control over your camera settings. Your camera uses SD memory cards. These cards are available in varying sizes from 1 to 8 gigabytes or more from third-party providers. The larger the card's memory capacity, the more images you'll be able to store before you archive your pictures. Keep in mind that your camera will operate faster if you periodically reformat your memory card rather than simply deleting images from it to free up space for more picture taking. Make sure that you don't reformat your card unless you've already copied the images that you want to save to another memory device. Reformatting your card will erase all the images. To format your memory card, press the menu button. Use the multi-selector to navigate to the setup menu. Highlight Format Memory Card and press the right arrow on the multi-selector. Highlight Yes and press OK. The last thing you'll want to do is focus the viewfinder. To do this, use the diopter adjustment dial located to the right of the eye cup. Rotate the dial until the automatic focus points in the viewfinder are in sharp focus. Now that the battery is in, the lens is attached, and the memory card is installed, you are just about ready to take your first picture. Your camera features a variety of shooting modes ranging from fully automatic to completely manual. This gives you a lot of flexibility and creative control over your photos. You can adjust the exposure, shutter speed, and depth of field settings on your camera to help capture the pictures you want. As you become more familiar with these concepts and principles, you'll improve your ability to capture the best pictures possible. We'll explore those concepts in depth later on in the DVD. First, let's talk about your camera's different shooting modes. Knowing how each shooting mode changes the camera settings will help you understand how to capture great pictures in all kinds of shooting conditions. Select the shooting mode you want to use by rotating the mode dial. This section of the mode dial contains the automatic and the scene modes for your camera. These modes are indicated by icons. The more advanced shooting modes are indicated by letters. In the automatic and scene modes, the camera chooses everything for you. All you have to do is point and shoot. This is how to configure your camera for basic shooting in full auto mode. Remove the lens cap and set the power switch to on. Select the auto mode by rotating the mode dial and lining it up with the indicator to the right of the dial. Your lens has two focus modes, manual and auto focus. Make sure the switch is in the AF or auto focus position. Then all you need to do is look through the viewfinder and aim any AF point over your subject. All of the AF points will be active and focus will usually be selected by the AF point covering the object that is closest to the camera. Aiming the center AF point over your subject will help make focusing easier. Press the shutter halfway down. The lens will move to focus. The AF point which achieves focus will briefly flash in red. At the same time, the beeper will sound and the focus confirmation light in the viewfinder will appear. If needed, the built-in flash will pop up automatically. Press the shutter completely to take the picture. In the default setting, the captured picture will be displayed for about two seconds on the monitor. Taking pictures in full auto mode is a good way to get a general feel for using your camera. To help conserve your battery, the camera will automatically hibernate after about 30 seconds if you haven't pressed any buttons. Just press the shutter or menu button to awaken it again. You can view the number of shots remaining on your SD card on the LCD monitor. The next mode setting is the flash off mode. Use this mode in places where flash photography is prohibited or inappropriate. This mode is good for candlelight scenes or if you want to create light streaks for creative effect. An added feature of the D3100 is the guide mode indicated with the word guide on the mode dial. 
Using this mode, you can easily access the frequently used functions of the camera. Within the guide mode menu, you can select shoot, view delete, or setup. We'll use the multi-selector to choose the shoot menu and easy operation. Here you can see the variety of options for great photos of specific subjects. Using the multi-selector, we can also go back to the previous menu and select advanced operation. Here there are a variety of options as well. In the soften background section, we can choose an aperture. Smaller numbers will make the background appear more blurred. Let's look at the scene modes. This is the portrait mode. To shoot in this mode, rotate the mode dial to select it. Use this mode when you want the subject to be in focus and what is behind the subject to have a soft focus. In portrait mode, the aperture is set wide open. The aperture is controlled inside of the lens. An open aperture indicates that the lens will let all the light it can into the shutter. With a wide aperture, you'll get a short depth of field. The next mode is the landscape mode. In this mode, the aperture will have a very narrow opening, creating a very long depth of field. The camera will then adjust the shutter speed to get the proper exposure. This mode will give you a sharp focus in both the foreground and the background. In this setting, the shutter speed can get pretty slow, so be sure to steady your camera or use a tripod to avoid camera shake. The next mode is the child mode. This shooting mode is great for snapshots of children. The camera will capture bright and vivid colors, but keep skin tones natural. To capture fast-moving subjects, select the sports mode. When shooting in sports mode, the camera selects a fast shutter speed to help freeze the action. A telephoto lens is a good investment if you want to shoot great action pictures. A telephoto or long lens helps you get closer to the action and gives you a greater range of focal length options. The next shooting mode is the close-up mode. This shooting mode is used to capture flowers or other small objects that are physically close to the camera's lens. Use this at the lens's minimum focusing distance. The next mode, the night portrait mode, is designed to capture your subject and obtain a natural looking exposure in the background. In order for the subject to be well lit, the flash will fire, and in order for the background to be in focus, the aperture is closed down a bit. The shutter will open for a relatively long period of time, so hold the camera still or support it with a tripod. If you have difficulty getting a sharp focus in this mode, try using full auto mode to see which mode settings help you get the best looking picture. Your camera can use either a zoom lens or a fixed lens, also called prime lenses. If your lens has a zoom ring, you can use the zoom ring to close in on a subject so it appears larger and fills more of the frame. The larger the focal length number on the zoom ring, the more the image will be magnified. Select longer focal lengths to zoom in and shorter focal lengths to zoom out. As you take pictures, practice reviewing them. Remember, you don't have to pay for film with digital cameras, so take as many pictures as you want and simply delete the images that don't turn out. To view the pictures captured on the SD card, press the playback button. Then use the multi-selector to scroll through the pictures. To zoom in on a picture, press the magnify button to enlarge the image and the multi-selector to view the desired part of the frame on the LCD monitor. Press the shutter button halfway down to cancel this mode to continue taking pictures. To delete an image, press the playback button, select the picture you want to delete, then press the delete button. Press the delete button again to erase the image. The image will then be deleted from the memory card. Once an image is erased, it cannot be recovered. 
make sure you no longer need the image before erasing it. Before we discuss the more advanced modes, let's review the basic theories of exposure by using an analogy. The amount of light needed for proper exposure is like a full bucket of water. The water tap used to fill the bucket is like the aperture or opening on your lens. The duration of the camera's shutter speed is similar to the amount of time you'll have to leave the water tap turned on to fill the bucket. The wider the tap is open, the more water will come through the nozzle into the bucket. This means the tap will only need to be open for a short amount of time. If the tap only has a narrow opening, on the other hand, water will only trickle into the bucket and you'll need to leave the water turned on for a much longer period of time to fill it up. Aperture is related to shutter speed in a similar way. If the aperture is small, you'll need to have a slower shutter speed to gather enough light to capture the appropriate exposure. If the aperture is large, however, you'll need to have a faster shutter speed to create the same effect. It's important to know that the shutter speed doesn't only affect the exposure, it also affects an image's clarity when you're shooting action scenes. A fast shutter speed will freeze a moving object, and a slow shutter speed will blur a moving object. Fast shutter speeds are good for shooting subjects that move quickly, such as athletes. Slow shutter speeds are useful when you want to blur the action. This can be good if you're trying to capture the movement of water or streaks of light at night. It's also important to understand the secondary effects of aperture. A small aperture opening, which is indicated by a large number, not only allows less light to reach the image sensor, but it also makes the entire scene appear sharper and more in focus. This optical phenomenon is called a long depth of field. It's especially useful when you want everything in the viewfinder to be sharp and in focus. A large aperture opening, indicated by a small number, has the opposite effect. Only your selected subject will be in focus. This phenomenon is referred to as a short depth of field. Portrait photography uses the short depth of field extensively because it focuses attention on the subject. Let's briefly examine one more photographic concept, aperture and shutter stops. Both shutter speeds and aperture have a standard series of settings called stops. Opening the aperture by one stop will double the light that reaches the sensor. Similarly, speeding up the shutter by one stop will cut the light that reaches the sensor in half. By opening the aperture one stop and speeding up the shutter one stop, you'll keep the exposure constant. Opening the aperture by two or three stops and slowing the shutter by two or three stops will have the same effect on exposure. It won't change. The amount of light that reaches the sensor will remain constant and the picture will be just as light or dark as before. What does change then? Well, the depth of field will change and a moving subject will be either frozen or blurred. Understanding depth of field will help give you more creative control for your photography and the know-how to take your pictures to an advanced level. Now that you're familiar with the automatic and scene modes on the mode dial, let's look at the other shooting modes. The first mode is called Program Auto Mode, which is represented with a P on the mode dial. In this mode, the camera automatically adjusts shutter speed and aperture for optimal exposure. Use this mode when you want to leave the camera in charge of shutter speed and aperture. To operate in this mode, turn the mode dial to P, press the shutter button halfway down to activate the viewfinder. To monitor the aperture and exposure settings, look through the viewfinder. Hold the shutter halfway down to focus, then press the shutter all the way to take the picture. Before we discuss the creative shooting modes further, it's important to understand a little more about shutter speeds and ISO settings. In the creative shooting modes, access is gained to ISO settings, aperture, and shutter speed settings. The shutter speed for your camera ranges from 30 full seconds to 1 4,000th meaning the shutter opens from 30 seconds to 1 4,000th of a second. Choosing a correct shutter speed for the appropriate situation can help you add depth and creativity to your pictures. Shutter speeds have a range of very fast to very slow. Let's talk about these speeds in depth for a moment. The most frequently used shutter speeds lie within the range of 1 500th to 1 60th of a second. This is a typical range used for everyday picture taking. 
Camera speeds slower than 1 60th will normally require a tripod to avoid blurring the picture. Faster shutter speeds are found in the range of 1 500th to 1 4000th. The LCD monitor displays the shutter speed as a fraction. Within the viewfinder, shutter speed is indicated with just a denominator. A fast shutter speed of 1 2000th to 1 4000th could be used to freeze the wings of a bee or the blades of a helicopter in flight. A shutter speed of 1 500th to 1 1000th would be good for freezing action at a sporting event. A moderate shutter speed of 1 125th to 1 500th could be used for taking portraits of friends or family. The slowest shutter speeds fall in the realm of 8 to 30 seconds. These shutter speeds are typically used for shooting subjects at night. The ISO setting affects the image sensor's sensitivity to light. The higher the number, the less light that is required to properly expose the image sensor. You can either have the camera automatically choose the sensitivity or you can set it manually. It's a good idea to set the ISO speed to suit the ambient light setting that you're shooting in. When you increase the ISO speed, a higher number, for low light, a faster shutter speed can be used to avoid blurry images. Set the ISO speed by pressing the information edit button once to activate the information display and a second time to place the cursor in the display. Use the multi-selector to navigate to the ISO section and press OK. Then choose your desired ISO with the multi-selector and press OK to save your changes. Keep in mind that a higher ISO setting may introduce noise or grain into your images. An ISO setting that is too high for the shooting conditions will make the image lose quality and you might even start to see particles in your picture. Experiment with ISO settings to become more familiar with their range and control. The image sensor on your camera is very powerful. It gives you the flexibility to shoot in low light conditions and still get amazing pictures. Here is a guide that will help you have a basic idea of what ISO settings to use in various situations. When you're outdoors in full sun, use ISO 100 or 200. In the shade, on an overcast day or indoors with lots of window light, use ISO 400. ISOs 800 and higher should be used indoors, for action shots, or in other low light conditions. The next setting on the mode dial is the shutter priority mode. Use this mode when you want to set the shutter speed and have the camera automatically select the correct aperture value. To shoot in this mode, set the mode dial to S. Rotate the command dial to select your desired shutter speed. You can view the shutter speed and aperture values through the camera's viewfinder or on the back LCD panel. The next setting on the mode dial is the Aperture Priority Mode. When shooting in this mode, you'll set the aperture value and then the camera will calculate the shutter speed necessary for a proper exposure. Select this mode when you want to create a long or short depth of field. To use this mode, set the mode dial to A and rotate the command dial to select an aperture value as you watch the display through the viewfinder or on the LCD panel. Once you've made your selection, press the shutter button to take the picture. When the f-stop is a small number, the aperture has a large opening, letting in more light, creating a short depth of field. This blurs the background and the foreground. When the f-stop is a large number, the aperture has a small opening, letting in a small amount of light, creating a long depth of field. This keeps the background and foreground in sharp focus. Remember, you can change the ISO settings to make your image more or less sensitive to light to match the ambient light you're shooting in. The next advanced shooting mode is manual or M mode. This mode gives you complete control of the camera. In manual mode, you will set the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO to create the exposure. To operate the camera in manual mode, rotate the mode dial to M. To set the shutter speed, rotate the command dial. To set the aperture, press and hold the aperture button while rotating the command dial. You can view the adjustments to the aperture and shutter speed on the information display. The exposure level mark lets you see how far you are from the proper exposure level. If the mark is toward the plus side of the scale, the image will be too bright or overexposed. If the mark is toward the minus side of the scale, the image will be too dark or underexposed. Adjust the aperture and shutter speed so that the exposure indicator is close to the center of the exposure scale. Then press the shutter button halfway down to focus and the rest of the way down to take the picture.
The Nikon D3100 has a sophisticated live view mode. In this mode, you can shoot while viewing a real-time image on the camera's LCD monitor. To shoot in live view mode, rotate the live view switch to LV. The view will be displayed on the camera's LCD. Your battery will not last as long using live view, so keep an eye on your battery meter. Warning, do not direct the lens into the sun while in live view. The sun's heat can damage the camera's internal components. Next, choose one of three focus modes. Press the information edit button to place the cursor in the information display. The focus mode options are single servo AF for stationary subjects, full time servo for moving subjects, and manual focus if you would like to focus manually. Highlight your selection with the multi selector and press OK. For the AFS and AFF focus modes, you will also need to choose an AF area mode. The AF area modes are available for all of the camera's shooting modes except auto and flash off. Choosing an AF area mode is very similar to choosing the focus mode. Press the information edit button to place the cursor in the information display. Then navigate to the AF area mode on the LCD and press OK. You can choose from face priority AF if you want the camera to automatically focus on faces, wide area AF for handheld shots or landscapes, normal area AF for focusing on a specific area of the frame, or subject tracking AF to track a subject as it moves across the frame. Press OK to make your selection. In wide and normal area AF modes, you can adjust the location of the focus point simply by using the multi-selector. To place the focus point at the center of the frame, press the OK button. Press the shutter halfway down to focus and the rest of the way down to take the picture. Your camera is also capable of recording amazing quality HD movies. To use the camera in movie mode, turn the live view switch to LV. Before shooting, select the focus mode and AF area mode as discussed in the live view section of this DVD. Set the camera's focus by pressing the shutter button halfway down. Use aperture priority mode or manual mode to set the aperture. Press movie record to start recording. To stop recording, press the same button again. Your movie files will be saved as MOV files. When shooting movies, use an SD Speed Class 6 memory card or higher. While shooting movies or in live view, be sure that you do not point the lens directly into the sun as it may damage the camera's components. To view a movie that you have recorded, press the playback button and scroll to the movie that you'd like to play. Press the OK button to enter the movie playback. In the menu, you can select the various movie settings by selecting the Shooting Menu tab and making changes. Let's set the movie recording size. Press Menu, use the multi-selector to scroll to the movie menu, highlight Movie Settings, and press the right arrow on the multi-selector to view options. Highlight Quality and scroll to the option that you'd like and press OK. The larger numbers mean higher quality movies and bigger file sizes. Smaller numbers are lower quality movies with smaller file sizes. Another important principle for taking a great picture is image sharpness. Image sharpness is affected by several things including camera shake, depth of field, digital noise and lens focus. Your camera has four focus modes, AFA or Auto Servo AF, AFS or Single Servo AF, AFC or Continuous Servo AF, and Manual Focus. Single Servo AF and Continuous Servo AF are available only in the PSA and M shooting modes. You can select the camera's AF mode in the information display. Press the Information Edit button once to activate the information display and again to place the cursor in the display. Use the multi-selector to highlight the current AF mode. Press OK to display the options. AFA or Auto Servo AF mode is the camera's fully automatic focus mode. AFS or Single Servo AF mode is great for stationary subjects. Use this mode for portraits, still life, landscapes, etc. AFC or Continuous Servo AF is for moving subjects. The camera will focus continuously while the shutter button is pressed halfway down. This is a great focus mode for sports or other moving subjects. MF or Manual Focus means that you will focus the camera manually using the focus ring on the lens. Press OK to confirm your selection. 
When focus has been achieved, the focus indicator will light in the viewfinder. In addition to the focus modes, the Nikon D3100 has AF area modes, which determine how the focus point for autofocus is selected. To choose an AF area mode, enter the information display with the information edit button. Then use the multi-selector to highlight the AF area mode. Press OK to see the AF area mode options. The first AF area mode is single point AF. In this mode, the camera will focus with only the selected focus point. Use this mode for stationary objects. The dynamic area AF mode is good for erratically moving subjects. In this mode, focus is achieved with one AF point and the camera will use surrounding AF points if the subject leaves the area. Auto Area AF is the camera's fully automatic AF area mode. The camera automatically focuses on the subject. The final AF area mode is 3D tracking. In this mode, the camera focuses on a single focus point and tracks the subject as it moves through the frame. This is a good mode to use for moving subjects. The viewfinder has 11 AF points. By selecting a suitable AF point, you can shoot with autofocus while framing the subject as desired. To do this, make sure that the lens switch is in the AF position and make sure that the camera is set to P, S, A, or M on the mode dial. In automatic and scene modes, the AF point selection will take effect automatically. When shooting in the more advanced modes, you can choose the AF point manually. The selected AF point will be displayed in the viewfinder and on the LCD panel. If all of the AF points light in the viewfinder, it means automatic AF point selection is in effect. To select an AF point manually, simply use the multi-selector to choose the focus point you'd like. You can press the OK button to quickly select the center AF point. Another cause of poor focus is camera shake. This happens when the camera moves while the shutter is open, exposing the image sensor. Always try to steady the camera. Holding it with two hands and pressing the viewfinder gently against your face will help. You can also lean against something or use a tripod, a monopod, or even a beanbag to steady the camera. You can also reduce the effect of camera shake by selecting a fast shutter speed. This reduces the amount of time the image sensor is exposed to shaky conditions. A helpful rule of thumb is to set your shutter speed to one over the focal length. Confusing? Let me explain. If the focal length of your lens is 300 millimeters, for example, you should set your shutter speed to at least 1 300th of a second. If the focal length is 30 millimeters, you might get by by using a shutter speed as low as 1 30th of a second. Another cause of poor focus is digital grain, which is sometimes called noise. You can avoid noise by not enlarging an image too much. If you know that you must enlarge an image, select as large a file format as possible. You can also keep out noise by photographing subjects that have good contrast. Finally, to keep noise out, you can let your camera cool off for a moment before shooting more pictures after heavy use. An overheated image sensor can add noise to your pictures. Sometimes you may actually want to include motion blur in your images for artistic effect. If this is the case, you would experiment with a slower shutter speed. You might also want parts of your image to be sharp and other parts to be out of focus. To create this effect, you can experiment with changes in depth of field. Proper exposure is clearly a major part of taking good pictures. By changing the aperture and shutter speed, you can change the depth of field and affect whether a moving object is sharp or blurred. You can make depth of field changes while keeping exposure just the way you want it. Release modes determine how many times the shutter releases when you press the shutter button. The D3100 has single frame, continuous, self-timer, and quiet shutter release modes. With these release modes, you can take pictures continuously, single shots, or use the 2 second or 10 second self-timer. The single and continuous release modes are set automatically in the automatic and scene modes. You have full control of the release modes in the other shooting modes. To access the release mode, simply rotate the release mode selector to the desired mode. In single shooting mode, one picture will be taken when you press the shutter button completely. This is a good mode for stationary subjects. The continuous release mode will record about three frames per second while the shutter button is pressed down completely. Use this mode for fast moving subjects. 
The self timer mode takes the picture 10 seconds after the shutter button is pressed completely. Use this for self portraits. In this mode, use a tripod or other device to steady the camera. The final release mode, the quiet shutter release, is like the single frame release mode, except it does not beep when focus is achieved. This mode keeps sound to a minimum in quiet surroundings. You've probably heard the term megapixel while shopping for a digital camera. Pixels are the smallest component of a digital image. The word pixel is short for picture element. A pixel is a tiny square made up of one solid color. Digital photos are made up of millions of these squares or pixels. This is similar to what you'd see if you look closely at a computer screen. The resolution or quality of a digital photo is determined by how many pixels the image sensor chip can capture. The resolution of a digital photo is measured in megapixels. A megapixel is equal to one million pixels. That means a 10 megapixel camera is capable of taking photos that contain 10 million pixels. Cameras capable of shooting one megapixel or less, such as those found in some cell phones, are good for emailing or viewing pictures on the web, but you can't make decent prints larger than two by three inches. A four megapixel camera will allow you to make great pictures up to about five and a half by eight inches. You can get quality 8x10 photos out of a 6 megapixel camera. The great thing about cameras with 6 or more megapixels is that you can crop your photos and still get large prints. It's important to note that you can always get your photos printed at a smaller size without losing quality. However, if you try to enlarge a photo with lower resolution, one with fewer pixels, you'll lose some quality in the image. You can save your pictures into two file types, RAW and JPEG let's discuss the differences and options available. JPEG uses the least amount of room on your memory card. To fit more photographs onto the memory card, the JPEG format compresses the file. You can view JPEGs as much as you want on your camera or computer without losing any of the image quality. You will lose some quality if you resave them on your computer. The more often you resave them, the more you'll notice the difference in quality. You don't lose quality if you just copy or move JPEGs on your computer. Unlike JPEGs, RAW files are not compressed. Because RAW files include more information, these files also take up more space on your memory card. RAW files are large compared to JPEGs. You can take pictures solely in RAW format, or you can set your camera to shoot in both RAW and JPEG formats at the same time. It's good to understand this extra information if you want to edit your photos with software or make really large prints. Each camera manufacturer has a slightly different RAW format. Because of these differences, RAW files can be incompatible with some photo editing software packages. You can, however, touch up your RAW photos on the software that came with your camera. You can also edit JPEGs using computer software, but the RAW format gives you more control in the editing process. Because of the nature of the RAW file format, you can continually edit and resave these files without losing any quality. As a general rule, use RAW files if you're going to extensively edit your photos. For everything else, use JPEGs. Your camera can also save each image as both a RAW and a JPEG file. Note, RAW plus JPEG takes up much more space on your memory card. Set the image recording quality to suit the intended image size for printing. The image quality settings are easily accessible in the information display. Enter the information display by pressing the information edit button twice. Use the multi selector to highlight the image quality setting. Press OK to show options. Here you can choose from RAW plus Fine JPEG, RAW, JPEG Fine, JPEG Normal, or JPEG Basic. As you scroll through the options, the approximate number of shots remaining will appear on the left side of the LCD. You'll also want to get into the habit of protecting great photos from accidentally being erased. To protect an image, press the playback button and use the multi-selector to scroll to the image you'd like to protect. Then simply press the protect button. A small key icon will appear on the top corner of the image. Protected files cannot be deleted using the delete button but they will be deleted if the memory card is reformatted. To remove protection from an image, simply press the Protect button again.
Your camera has a built-in feature called Picture Controls, which allow you to customize the look of your image. There are six picture controls, including Standard, Neutral, Vivid, Monochrome, Portrait, and Landscape. To view and select the picture controls, first make sure that your camera is set to P, S, A, or M shooting modes. Then press the menu button and use the multi-selector to highlight the shooting menu. Scroll to picture control and press the right arrow button on the multi-selector to display options. Highlight the option you'd like to select and press OK. The standard picture control is the default setting and it offers standard processing and balanced results. This is a good picture control for general situations. The neutral picture control is a good setting to choose if you wish to process your images with your computer. Colors in this picture style are natural and subdued. The vivid picture control is great for images with primary colors that you'd like emphasized. The monochrome picture control is useful when you would like to take black and white photographs. Note, images taken in this setting cannot be converted to color later. The portrait picture control is great for portraits. It offers pleasant skin tones and textures. The landscape picture control is good for taking pictures of scenery or cities outdoors. Let's modify a picture control. First, we'll select a picture control to modify. We'll choose Vivid. Press the right arrow on the multi-selector. To adjust the settings, we can use the arrows on the multi-selector. To make the color on the Vivid picture control a little less saturated, select Saturation and use the multi-selector to choose a value toward the minus side of the scale. Press OK to save changes. Picture controls that have been modified are shown with an asterisk in the picture control menu. Now let's discuss white balance. It's important to understand that the quality of your pictures is affected by the color of the surrounding light and how the camera's electronics process that light. Compensating for varying light conditions is referred to as setting the white balance. Most light looks white to an untrained eye, but it can be composed of a range of different colors. For example, the color of sunlight is different in daylight, in the shade, or in cloudy conditions. Daylight, for example, is fairly blue and fluorescent light is fairly green. If your camera is set to shoot in daylight, but you're shooting in a setting with fluorescent light, your image will look overly red. Proper camera white balance takes into account the color temperature of a light source, which refers to the relative warmth or coolness of white light. Human eyes are very good at judging what is white under different light sources. However, digital cameras often have great difficulty determining auto white balance, or AWB. Incorrect white balance can create unattractive blue, orange, or even green colors in your photos, which are unrealistic and can be detrimental to your portraits. The white balance scale is expressed in measurements of Kelvin. The higher color temperatures measured in the area of 5600 Kelvin to 7500 Kelvin represent situations like a sunlit or cloudy day. These shooting situations have a greater amount of blue tones and a lesser amount of red tones. Lower color temperature situations are measured in the area of 3200 Kelvin down to 1900 Kelvin and are found in lighting situations like standard lighting from a tungsten light bulb or candlelight. These types of shooting situations are found on the lower end of the spectrum and produce greater amounts of red tones and lesser amounts of blue tones. Once you get acquainted with the camera's preset white balance settings, you can try setting your own by using the camera's custom white balance feature. To use this tool effectively, you will want to be familiar with the color temperature that is most effective for your shooting situation. Again, most light looks white to an untrained eye. Setting your white balance will help your pictures have the proper coloring. If natural looking colors cannot be obtained with auto white balance, you can set the white balance manually to suit the respective light source. In the auto and scene modes, the white balance will be set automatically. Your camera will attempt to automatically determine the white balance when it's set to the auto white balance mode. This is the default setting, but you can get better results by setting a preset white balance or by manually customizing the white balance. Here are some of your options. To access the white balance settings, press the Information Edit button twice to place the cursor in the information display. Then use the multi-selector to highlight the current white balance setting and press OK. On this screen, you can use the multi-selector to choose a white balance option and then press OK to confirm the selection. We've already covered the AWB setting. In this mode, the camera will automatically set the white balance for you. 
The incandescent light setting is used when taking pictures under common light bulbs. It reduces the reddish tone in a picture. This setting is marked with a light bulb icon. The fluorescent light setting is great for taking pictures under fluorescent lighting. The next white balance setting is direct sunlight. Direct sunlight is a great setting for taking pictures in the sunlight. This setting is marked with a sun icon. Use the flash setting when you are using the built-in or an external flash unit. Use the cloudy setting when taking pictures on days that are overcast. This is marked with a cloud icon. The shade setting is great to use when you're taking pictures in the shade. It reduces the bluish tones in a picture. This setting is marked by an icon of a house with shade. The next icon is the preset manual or custom white balance option. Use this setting when you want to manually set the white balance for a specific light source for better accuracy. This is done by taking a picture of a white card or object and then selecting the image for the camera's electronics to reference. An 18% gray card, which can be purchased at your local camera store, will give you the most accurate results. You can also use a white card, an object like a shirt, or a piece of paper to achieve similar results. To set a preset manual or custom white balance, press the menu button. In the shooting menu, select white balance and press the right arrow on the multi-selector to display the options. Select preset manual and press the right arrow on the multi-selector again. Highlight measure and press the right arrow. When the warning dialog pops up, highlight yes and press OK. When the camera is ready to measure white balance, a flashing PRE will appear in the viewfinder and information display. Now take a photo of a white or neutral gray object completely filling the viewfinder. Focus manually and set the standard exposure. If the camera was able to record the manual white balance setting, the information display will show data acquired and the viewfinder will show GD. Be aware that custom white balance settings are not a one-size-fits-all solution. These settings are very specific to each lighting situation. You should reset the preset manual white balance every time the lighting conditions change. You can measure light by using your camera's light meter. By measuring the light in each part of the frame, you'll get a sense for how bright or dark the various areas are. If an area is too bright, it will be clipped by the image sensor and appear completely white. If an area is too dark, it will appear grayish and full of noise. There are three ways you can measure light. These are the camera's metering modes. To access the metering modes, press the information edit button twice to place the cursor in the information display. Then use the multi-selector to highlight the current metering mode. Press OK to view metering mode options. The first metering mode is called matrix metering. This is an all-around metering mode suited for portraits and even backlit situations. The camera sets the exposure automatically to suit the scene. This is a good mode to use for many situations, but sometimes when the scene is very bright or very dark, you'll want to use a different metering mode. The center weighted metering mode is weighted at the center and then averaged for the entire scene. This mode is also good to use with portraits or other general picture taking. Spot metering is for metering a specific part of the subject or scene. The metering is weighted at the center covering about 3.8% of the viewfinder area. Use this mode when there is sharp contrast between the subject and the background. When you're choosing which metering mode to use, be sure to pay close attention to the light in the situation and the light that is falling on your subject. When light shines directly onto a subject from a bright lamp or other source, it usually creates stark contrast and pronounced shadows. It's generally more flattering to shoot under cloud cover, in the shade, or with reflected or diffused light. A good example of diffused light is when light reflects off an umbrella or shines through silk. The direction of the light will impact how your pictures turn out. Try moving your subject around and bouncing and reflecting light to achieve just the look you're after. By shining a bit more light on one side of an object than another, you'll create depth in the photo. This is an important quality for good two-dimensional images. The greater the contrast between the light and dark portions, the more dramatic your photo will look. As we talked about previously, a great photo will show a full range of light. You'll have bright spots, dark spots, and everything in between. 
Arrange your subjects and adjust the lighting until you achieve a great balance of highlights, midtones, and shadows. You can use backlight to underexpose a subject that's in the foreground, and this will create silhouettes, which can be a great artistic effect. Your D3100 has a powerful built-in flash that can provide you with extra light in certain shooting scenarios. As a general rule, you'll want to keep your subject within about 3.5 to 20 feet for the best results. To use the built-in flash in the P, S, A, and M modes, simply press the flash button and the flash will pop up. In the automatic and scene modes, the built-in flash will pop up and fire automatically in low light or backlit conditions. In flash off mode, landscape mode, and sports mode, the flash will not fire. The built-in flash has five different flash modes to choose from. To access the flash modes, press the information edit button twice to place the cursor in the information display. Use the multi-selector to highlight the current flash mode and press OK. Here you can see the flash mode options. The first flash mode is automatic. This mode is a good general use flash mode. The camera will calculate how much light is needed and the flash will provide that light. The next flash mode is red eye reduction. This mode is good to use when you're photographing people or pets. In this mode, a tiny pre-flash will fire, which causes the size of a person's pupils to shrink, lessening the effect of red eye in the photo. The third flash mode is the flash off mode. Use this mode when you do not want the flash to fire regardless of lighting. The next flash mode is slow sync mode. This mode is a good mode to use when you're photographing a subject at night and you'd like to have the background and the subject properly exposed. The last flash mode is rear curtain sync. In this mode, the flash fires just before the shutter closes, which will create a stream of light behind light sources. The subject will be properly exposed. If the image is too bright or too dark, you can use flash exposure compensation to make adjustments. To set the flash exposure compensation, press the information edit button twice to place the cursor in the information display. Scroll to the flash compensation options and press OK. Using the multi-selector, adjust the flash compensation. If you choose a value in the minus side of the scale, the flash will output less light. Values in the plus side of the scale will make the flash produce more light. Two more important elements of good photography are angle and magnification. You can move around to change the angle you're taking the picture from. By doing this, you can shoot pictures from slightly above, below, or to the side of your subject to achieve just the right look. You can change the look even more by moving closer or farther away. Close-ups are great and you'll want to include the eyes, make sure they're well lit. Sometimes a full body shot or even a shot from farther back can help you establish your location and situation, which may be just the look you're going for. Practice changing your angle to get some really great shots. The lens you shoot with will also affect the general look of your picture. Sometimes it's more convenient or practical to simply change the lens instead of actually moving closer to or farther away from your subject. One great advantage of a digital SLR camera is that you can attach different lenses depending upon your needs and circumstances. There is a wide variety of lenses to choose from. A telephoto lens, for example, will make things appear closer. This type of lens is said to have a long focal length. A common focal length for great portrait photography is about 100 millimeters. A normal lens is considered to be about what the human eye sees, something between 40 and 50 millimeters. A wide angle lens will make things appear farther away and can also distort the image in some very interesting ways. This type of lens is said to have a short focal length. Zoom lenses are very common. Simply rotate the zoom ring to move from one focal length to another. Lenses used on digital SLR cameras are ideally designed to fit the projected image on the digital image sensor. Another element of a great photograph is composition. The placement of objects is critical if you want to make your photos look finished and artistic. It's a good idea to showcase the main subject. 
You can make the subject stand out by adjusting the placement of the subject, the lighting, or the focus. You can even vary the background and foreground elements. Practice seeing what these different principles can do for your photos. You should also consider the orientation of your photo. Do you want a vertical image or a horizontal image? Some subjects look better vertically and others horizontally. It depends upon the look and feel you're going for. It's also important to think about placing the horizon line. The horizon is where the sky meets the land. A great photo will typically show the most important subjects in the upper portion of the frame, where the eyes naturally want to look. But sometimes it works best to divide the picture horizontally by the horizon. You can move the horizon line higher or lower depending on your subject matter. Another good idea is to place your subject off-center. This sometimes creates a much more pleasing image. The rule of thirds advocates dividing your viewfinder into thirds both horizontally and vertically and then placing your most important subjects on the cross points. A great photo is often simple. Remember that it sometimes requires patience to get just the right shot. One way to direct the viewer's eyes in interesting ways and to make a picture interesting to look at is to notice the lines, shapes, and textures in your subject and apply composition principles to accentuate those things. Sometimes a great picture is waiting for you in the patterns and repetitions of daily life that often go unnoticed. You can create the illusion of depth in your photos simply by adjusting the focus and lighting. Finally, use foreground objects and natural frames to enclose and give context to your primary subject. To review, let's go through some examples of these situations to manually apply the principles learned in this DVD. First, let's approach a portrait situation. It's always smart to first preset the white balance to match the current lighting. Use the preset or custom white balance. To make the subject the focus point, position the subject in the frame in a way that will draw more attention to the subject. You can achieve this by using the rule of thirds. Make sure the focus point is correct. Another great way to give focus to the subject is by blurring the background. This effect is achieved by opening the aperture. Remember, the smaller the F number, the larger the aperture opening. After the aperture is set, adjust the shutter speed to achieve a proper exposure. By opening the aperture more, you create a short depth of field. This will allow your focus point to be in sharp focus while the background will have a soft focus. The next common situation is a landscape. You will usually want the whole landscape to be in sharp focus. To achieve this, the aperture will need to be set for a very narrow opening. Remember, the larger the F number, the smaller the depth of field. A small opening creates a very long depth of field. This mode will give you a sharp focus in the foreground and the background. Then adjust the shutter speed to achieve a proper exposure. In this setting, the shutter speed can get pretty slow, so be sure to steady your camera or use a tripod to avoid camera shake. When taking pictures at sporting events or shooting subjects with a lot of motion, it's a good idea to prepare your camera before the action begins. Here are some tips to help you prepare. First, preset your white balance. Second, set your focus to AF continuous so the camera will be focusing continuously. You'll also want to set the AF area mode to 3D tracking. Third, set your camera to the continuous shooting mode so when the action happens, you only need to hold down the button. Now, position yourself to have the best angle for the action. If you want your subject to be in sharp focus, turn your ISO up to around 400 to 1600. Next, adjust your shutter speed relatively high, then adjust your aperture for a proper exposure. Take a couple of practice shots to fine tune. Now you're ready for action. If you want to show a little blur to add aesthetic effect, slightly slow the shutter speed. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about your Nikon D3100. We know this new information will give you enough confidence and know-how to take your photography skills to new levels. Remember, you can refer back to any section of this DVD at any time. Just select the topics you want to review from the main menu or table of contents. 
Watch for more Quick Pro guides on using newly released cameras. Thanks for watching. We've covered a lot and we hope it helps you unlock the full potential of your camera. There's a lot more that goes into capturing great photos than simply knowing all the functions on your camera. Quick Pro Camera Guides has developed a series of DVDs that walk you through important photography tips to give your photos the wow factor. You'll learn the tricks and tips that the pros use to capture amazing images, and you'll learn how to control your camera's settings to take pictures that will amaze your family and friends. Just go to quickproguides.com to see our full line of instructional DVDs and camera-specific tutorials.